Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And on today's show, I've got a guest for you. Aaron Clark, Under Color of Law. This is one of those books that you pick up and you can't put down. How many times do you get a chance to have that happen? It doesn't happen all that often, does it? Does it for you? It doesn't for me. I read a lot of books. Some of them, yeah, I kind of rip through. Others, I'm like, I'm getting through it. Anyway, Under Color of Law by Aaron Philip Clark. It's one of those books. So why don't I shut this trap and get to the show? We've got Aaron waiting here on The Thriller Zone. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. How you doing? I am so good. I hope you are. Yeah, definitely. It's raining, though, which we normally here in L.A., we, we get rain maybe five times a year. So... I don't know if that's omen. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> no, it it means goodness is washing on the earth. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in San Diego, so I, I think I'm getting oh. the, I'm getting a little uh, remnants of that. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a storm. Welcome to the Thriller Zone, Aaron Clark. Thank you for having me. Yes. This book right here, Under Color of Law, uh, I am constantly reminded of myself, my little inner voice going, dude, you're geeking out, you're saying some of the same things twice sometimes, but this was a powerful, powerful book. Thank you. I friggin' loved it. I, uh, every, I read a lot of books, Aaron, uh, uh, they, you know, for this show. Very few get me up at the crack it on and have me reading before my day starts. But this is one of those. We're going to talk about this in a second. Appreciate that. But uh, I wanted to, I want to first get to know you because uh, I got to know, you know, by the way, you were or are a police officer? Help no. Me. So I was uh, in the police academy. So in 2014 and, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I basically was in the academy for halfway of training. Um, and then I suffered an injury and had to, uh, essentially they call it, um, you know, leave on your own accord, but you know, you, there, you know, there's other terms for it, but that's kind of what, <laughs> that's kind of what happened. So, uh, you know, due to my injury, um, I just couldn't finish the physical training part, which is obviously required. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was going, th the reason I asked that is because I, I thought to myself, all right, this guy has, has either lived it or he is a, uh, a mad researcher because, uh, my first, mm, I've written a couple of books, but my first, what I'd call commercial, it's not traditionally published, but kind of that commercial feel was based on a Hollywood detective, a female Hollywood detective, no less. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I'm a big Michael Conley fan. And I thought, I wonder if I could do kind of a Bosch thing, but female. And I thought I had it pretty well down until I started reading this book. And then I'm like, oh, geez, I need to go back to school. And I wrote two two of them, a, a sequel. And I'm like, oh, I got to go back to school. God. Well, I mean, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, it, it's almost like research by fire in my case. <laughs> you know, it's like I had so much... Uh, to pull from. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, with this book, it kind of just poured out, you know, I had years of, of having grown up in a family with law enforcement and then going through it myself, you know, I had just had a lot stored up, I guess you could say. Well, there's a, a palpable resonance that y you have, <clears throat> you've been around the dialogue, you've been around the atmosphere. That's, I think that's the key here. And it's this feeling of, I, I really feel like I'm there. I feel like I'm inside uh, the police station. I'm when I hear the conversations among their peers. There's a certain vernacular that goes with law enforcement, I believe. And boy, just nailed it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, I worked on a little phrase because you blend you, you blend like anger and empathy and violence and tenderness while still morphing in topics of uh, law enforcement, family relationships, uh, just a magnificent blend. And I, and it made me walk away going, I wonder where Aaron got his passion to tell stories from. And that, that's how I want to start this interview. Okay. 
Sure. I mean, I guess I would say that that started relatively young. Um, so I remember summer school, I must have been maybe seven or eight. And uh, we had this uh, kind of creative writing workshop. And it was my best, it was the best day in terms of, you know, that summer school week when we had this workshop. And so I had a really cool teacher um, who just encouraged me. He just liked the story and he was like, all right, well, write me another one with the same characters. And I was like, oh, I never thought about that. You're talking about a series here. <laughs> so, you know, every week I would just keep writing him, you know, different stories and he, and he would just be really into it. Um, and so I think that kind of helped foster you know, some of that early passion. Um, and, you know, it was almost like saying like, oh, people actually like what I'm, what I'm writing. And so, you know, from there, I honestly thought early on that I would go into visual art or, you know, maybe I had a love for comics. I thought maybe I would be a comic book writer and artist and, um, you know, life just started throwing different curveballs, And I, I found myself in, um, you know, the film industry. Um, had, having gone to film school and thought, okay, I'll be a screenwriter. And then um, slowly but surely that just became fiction, you know, and I, I went and got my master's for uh, fiction and, and that was it. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> now I'm starting to see a thread. I mean, when you step up for a master's degree in, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> you know that you're serious. Uh, Side point, I went into my library this weekend and dug out this. Have you, are you familiar with the portable MFA in writing? No. Okay. This is first I've heard. Supposedly, this is the New York Writers Workshop. The only reason I tell you about this is because I, I broke it out. I bought this quite a while ago, and I'm like, I'm interviewing all these guys like yourself who, who you can tell you have gone to school and really mastered your craft. So I pull it out and I'm telling my wife about it and I'm, I, I'm doing one of the very first uh, exercises in the front and, I'm, and in an instant I went, oh, I'm thinking too small. So the reason I bring that up is mm. the fact that you have taken it to the next level really tells me a lot about you. This is not just a, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to try a little writing on the side. No, you're you're all in. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, um, it's tough. Okay? Yeah. MFA programs are, are, are not, uh, they're not easy by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, I think what happens oftentimes is that it becomes um, almost like a little creative intellectual battlefield when it comes to these workshops. And I told myself early on, I said, you know what, if I can survive some of these workshops, because there's people who really hate your stuff in there and they will tell you. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, some of these workshops, there was, there was a time where our, one, of our, one of my peers, one of the students got into it with our, our professor and it was ugly, you know, it was, it was bad. And so I said, well, if I can survive this, <laughs> I have a pretty good shot, you know, at getting published here. <laughs> wow. I didn't know it was so relentless. I've heard other stories from other uh, master's program takers, and they said, oh, it's such a, such a supportive environment. I'm like, supportive is good. I'm all for that. And I'm, I'm all for being fair and uh, uh, gracious. But, you know, sometimes I just want you to go, Aaron, if we're in the class together, tell me what you hated about this. I mean, really... Rip it a new one because I need a little help of objectivity, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> and you know what? It also begs this question. It's obvious that you're a big reader, which uh, the best writers, I think, in my opinion, are the biggest readers. Do you have some favorite authors that you, yeah, these are the top. I would say the biggest influence early on was Walter Mosley. Actually came across um, Devil in a Blue Dress. I was on my, in my father's library. And I was, I was young. I wasn't supposed to be reading that, <laughs> that particular row of books, right? Oops. Uh, because, <laughs> yeah, because next to De Devil in a Blue Dress was Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. And um, what else did he? Oh, it was Toni Morrison. I, you know, I think uh, also Beloved was there. So it was, it was a whole row, right? Where it was like, obviously, this is not where I should be. And then he had comic books in there, too, which is probably uh -huh. where I should be. But, <laughs> you know... I read Walter Mosley, Devil in a Blue Dress, and it just opened up a new world to me. And I said, wow, this is, I think it, it, the story hit me on such a visceral level 
where I was so interested in the history, you know, being young, I think I was probably maybe like 12, 11 or 12. Okay. And then also this crime and then these kind of nefarious politicians, you know, and, and, and I was just like, wow, like you can write this stuff, like we can do this. <laughs> and so, you know, it just, it, it just changed. It, it, it was like a spark went off in my head. And, and I'll always remember that reading experience. It's like, when I sit down and write, I try and capture that. I try and right. capture, you know, as I'm reading kind of my own stuff to see if I can get that, that spark back that I had when I first read Devil in Blue Dress. And I did not know that you had written so much. Um, I mean, this is, this is kind of, I, I wanted to say this is your debut, but it's not really your debut. Because in the front, I've got The Furious Way, The Science of Paul, and A Healthy Fear of Man. Now, is The Furious Way, is that the one with the uh, uh, the dog on the front? The red cover yeah. with the dog? Yeah. Dude, I went on uh, Amazon over the weekend just because I wanted to read some more of you. So, and I, I started that, and I, I was as far as I could go in the take of you now. Yeah. That I one, that's that's gripping. <laughs> it, it's probably the most, it's, in terms of pulpy, it's the most, <laughs> it's, it's the pulpiest thing I've written. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir. Pulp with a capital P. Yeah. It's, uh, and for me, you know, it was, um, it was kind of a palate cleanser because I had written uh, the Paul Little novel. So the first book I wrote was The Science of Paul. Um, and that actually was my master's thesis. Oh, wow. And so, you know, I had written that while in grad school, um, about halfway, I think I got about halfway in grad school. And then I finished it, uh, you know, once I, once I was done with classes, you go into your thesis, you know, your thesis term. And so at the time I was living in North Carolina and I, it was a whole, whole lot to do. So I just finished it, you know, and I was able to, excuse me, and I was able to um, get it actually published in the hands of a uh, New Pope Press prior to uh, submitting it to the thesis board. So I already had the publishing contract. And so I said, all right, well, you know what? I think it's done. <laughs> I submitted it. Um, and luckily, it just happened this way. But James Salas, who who was another, we're talking about authors who are a big influence. Um, you know, I read a lot of James Salas, and James Salas had taught at one time uh, from my MFA program, and so you could pick any faculty member who who taught. So I, I sent it to James. I said, hey, you know, if you have some time, I would love for you to, you know, be on my thesis board. And he said, yeah, no problem. Super nice guy. And so he was a part of my thesis board, and then he loved the novel so much. And I said, you know, do you mind blurbing this thing? And he said, yeah, of course. So he gave me this wonderful blurb. Which I'm going to interrupt you here because this was my very next point. I'm going to read it for you. T.S. Eliot referred to it as tradition and individual talent, the manner in which new work at once honors, builds upon, and questions what has come before. Chester Hines, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Aaron Philip Clark has been paying attention. <laughs> Man, how did that make you feel? I mean, dude, that's that's not just a, this is a gripping page turner. It was early on a pinnacle in my writing career. I, when I got that blurb, I think I I said, oh, okay. Like, you know, obviously you're happy, right? Because you're like, James Salas gets this, <laughs> you know, he gets it. But at the same time, I was like, it was such a uh, just monumental and generous blurb. And I, and I, you know, for a while it was up on the, up on my wall. Um, because I said, you know, that's what I'm trying to kind of capture this, you know, there's a lot of existentialism in there, but it, it's also hearkening back to, you know, the Harlem Renaissance writers um, and really having that kind of poetic gravitas is what I was after, you know, especially with that, with that book, Science of Paul. Well, when I saw the quote, it made me stop and pay attention, uh, uh, thus the final line. But then I realized, oh, this is the cat that wrote Drive. Yeah. With Ryan, Go that turned into the movie Ryan Gosling, right? Right. Which is one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, he's super cool and easy to look at, and he's a uh, great driver. But the story is so powerful. I'll never forget this, if you'll allow me. I went to the theater to watch it. I was so taken by it, I went out and bought the soundtrack that next day, listened oh, yeah. to it over and over, bought the book, went back, saw the movie again, because for whatever reason, it was so 
gripping and you use the word existential and that's so true that that one final scene not to ruin it for anybody but where he's sitting leaning up you think he's a goner yeah. and yeah and then he keeps going <laughs> that's the drive <laughs> exactly yeah. and the way the camera moves in on that and you're like oh my god that can't have happened and then it didn't oh just a solid and so anyway my point is to have that kind of a quote front and center on your website, what that must have done to boost your confidence, I cannot imagine. Yeah, I mean, coming, like I said, coming out of the MFA program, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I felt like I, you have to be pretty confident to think, okay, I'm going to sit down and write a book, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I had experiences within the program that I won't say shook my confidence, but I would say kind of were like, eh, you know, are people just not getting it what I'm after here? And so that quote really helped solidify how I felt about my own writing, you know? Um, and I, I, I really just said to myself, you know what, especially with the science of Paul, I was like, I'm not pulling any punches. This is, this is going to be this, this type of story that I want to tell, um, you know, which really centers on, and at that time, nobody was really, um, interested in reading about uh in terms of publishers big big publishers i should say um you know books that centered on um ex-cons you know and so paul little is this ex-con um who's really just doesn't have a place in the world uh really feels cut off and his grandfather dies and he ends up inheriting this land in north carolina and all he wants to do is get back to that and there's so many obstacles and challenges that he has to overcome and he gets swept up in this this uh you know murder mystery two questions quick uh what part of north carolina oh at that time i was actually living um out, uh, winston salem okay so that's yeah. where i was born Really? You were I born was, in Winston-Salem? I was born in Winston-Salem. Oh, man. That's Grew up in a little... There's a town right outside of Winston-Salem. You're not going to believe what the name of the town is. And I grew up across the street from thousands of acres of tobacco. The town I grew up in, Tobaccoville. Oh, yeah. yeah right yeah, outside winston -Salem. Yeah. I have met, met very few people who have spent any time in and around Winston-Salem, but that's cool. <laughs> well, you know, my first year in, in college, I, I went to uh, North Carolina School of the Arts. That's where I went to film school, right there in Winston. So, yeah. That's wow. a small world. It is a small world. And, <laughs> and now you're in Pasadena and I'm San Diego, right? And I used to live in San Diego. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> I love the way the world just throws us little little things like that. Okay, so the other thing is uh, you were referring to, oh, uh, Shotgun Honey published. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I say that is there I've discovered more up and coming authors from shotgun honey matter of fact uh, mark westmerlin was on the show jb stevens um we got a couple of folks coming up next week uh, next month ashley irvin bobby matthews ron ron earl ron ron earl yeah ron earl, yeah guy has an eye for uh, talent uh, an ear for talent and an eye for art because i think i heard somewhere that he designs a lot of the covers and i'm like man this guy uh, okay so let's get to this i do want to say that one of the most powerful things that you accomplished uh in my opinion uh certainly not a, not negating your power of entertainment is how you made me stop and think i think that's the best and highest compliment i can pay you because um, you know, I, I, I like entertainment. It, it was, gr it was very entertaining, but boy, it made me look through life through a slightly different lens. And I feel like I'm pretty broad spectrum kind of guy, but, um, powerful that way, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is, that's a very high compliment. Um, you know, I guess I try and achieve the, the trifecta, right. Which is to, you know, obviously entertain, but also enlighten and educate um, when I kind of sit down and, and craft these stories. And, I, and oftentimes I, I think in terms of making sure that this, the, you know, the story's at the forefront, um, you know, and really ensuring that it's, it's entertaining. But at the same time, if, if, if someone walks away and says, oh, that was cool, you know, or uh, that's an okay story, you know, it, it actually doesn't, <laughs> it makes me feel like, eh, you know, it's almost like, well, that was satisfactory, right? <laughs> You know, it's like, it's a solid C. And, and, and for me, you know, I, whether you love it or hate it, I just want you to 
have some sort of reaction, right? But if you walk away kind of apathetic, then it's like, eh, you know, and you can't please everybody, but you know, that's, that's a litmus test for me. Well, you, you cannot walk away from this book and not be affected in some way. And I, it's funny, my wife will say, she'll cook a dish and she'll go, how you like it? And she'll know if I go, yeah, it was good. Mm -hmm. If it's, it was good. She knows that that <laughs> is not really that great. But if I go, babe, this is, this is incredible. So I must be tonality up or down, whatever it is. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I told her, she goes, you know, cause she watch, she sees me over in the corner in the breakfast nook, you know, at, at 5 AM sitting there reading under the light. And she goes, uh, is that a good book? I'm like, oh yeah. She goes, oh, it's not a, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. I mean, it's like when you really come across something that you connect to, um, you know, like for me, obviously, it was the first thing was Devil in a Blue Dress. You yeah. know, it's something that happens um, just in your brain. And then also it's like a physical reaction where you can't stop reading, you know. And so you just find yourself you have this vicarious experience Yes. with, you know, for me, it was with Easy Rollins. And so that's what I was hoping people would have, you know, with Trevor Finnegan. You, you may not agree with what he does. You may say, oh, man, you know, get it together. But I want you to at least feel, you know, kind of have that feeling that you're there with him, that you're you're going through almost like real time um, as he gets thrown these curveballs. You're solving this mystery with him. And you know what? I I admired his bravery. I admired his. You know, I, I I'm not a black guy in America today, so I got to see. I got to look through that lens and 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 appreciate what that is like. And it always makes me. It humbles me to realize that I always have to be aware of where everybody is coming from. And I love that. And I love the interracial uh, relationships and the way he handled it. And then of course his girlfriend that he that is early on in the story. And I think. It, it was wonderful, Aaron, how you you teed up this love story, then you kind of stole it away, and then she has, then he has this, you know, pretty shallow relationship. I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with him one time or another. And then the way you bring her back, oh man, <laughs> I know I'm geeking out here. I think my point is the fact that you're able to layer in so many layers of emotion, the anxiety of being a black cop, the anxiety of trying to fight what he thought was right when maybe he was turning his back on his uh, fellow uh, brothers in uh, the law enforcement. Yeah, when I conceived the story, I, I from my experience, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't I didn't have Trevor Finnegan's experience. <laughs> but I know officers who, who had something similar. And so really he's, um, he's an amalgamation of a lot of officers that I encountered. Right. Um, and I wanted to kind of show that there's something about being a police officer where, especially if you're a black officer, where you, you exist in this really interesting, interesting space. So it's politics coming at you um, it's things that you have to kind of balance within, you know, the department, um, their society view of you. And I wanted to kind of pile that on Trevor, um, all with this idea that, yes, he's going to be solving this case that is bringing a lot of these issues up. But oftentimes what drives people to become law enforcement, I think it's easy for us to say, okay, they're just, you know, maybe they're bullies or they always were bullies, but for Trevor, it's, it's trauma. And when I was in the Academy, it was interesting because a lot of my fellow recruits um, didn't go deep into it, but they alluded to something happening within their lives that drove them in that direction. Now, not all of them, because right. there was a few in there who really just, I think, wanted to hold a gun. But you know, yeah. there, was, <laughs> there yeah. was a good number of them that something happened. And that is what kind of sent them on a different path that maybe they weren't they weren't necessarily thinking they would go on. Well, mission accomplished on stacking the deck for Finnegan. I mean, mission accomplished. <clears throat> the other thing is, yeah, there is a little bit of wild, wild west. I want to grab a gun and, you know, yippee ki -yay and and take the take authority into my own hands uh, mentality, which is a little misdirected, in my opinion. 
um, especially when it comes to uh, so many of the things, and we could spend hours on this, but we won't, uh, that uh, have happened in uh, of recent that are tragic, doesn't even begin to touch, doesn't even begin to touch this abuse of power, et cetera. But, and that's what I, I think that's what I walked away, Aaron, so appreciating. You didn't, you know, it wasn't preachy. You know, you never set out to do that. You just set out to, to show this, uh, this, you know, broken guy who was trying to do the best that he could. And he was a little withdrawn emotionally yet the, the integrity of what he wanted to do by uncovering the truth is what I think I admired the most. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that sums it up. I mean, he, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not easy you know, being in a position like Trevor and to get in his position, he had to make some choices that a lot of people, <laughs> I'm not one to read reviews, but you know, a lot of people were just like, you know, when, when that moment reveals itself of kind of what he did to get where he's at, you know, it's either people either love it or, or kind of hate it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's for me, it was realistic because for him to be in that position, and have a father like he has, not a father who is who is deputy chief or something, but to have a father who he has, who really didn't pave the way for him, right? right? Because there's this whole thing of legacy within law enforcement, especially LAPD, where, you know, if you have a family member yeah. who's up there, you know, you kind of, you can skate through a little bit, you know, yeah. but Trevor didn't have that. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> um, it does beg the question, and I think, I think I read somewhere there is a sequel coming, right, Aaron? There is. So, uh, Blue Like Me uh, will be out in November. Yeah. All I can say is, <laughs> is that <laughs> this one, this one is uh, very twisty, and um, essentially is going to deal with the idea. If I if to talk about it in terms of theme, but one of the themes. You know, one of the overarching themes is this idea of, um, you know, toxic relationships that exist within law enforcement. Um, the idea that people will do whatever they, they, it's almost a hive mentality. And that, you know, if your partner is doing something, you know, it's a lot of officers who got in trouble who said, well, my partner wrote me into this, or I was just trying to help my partner. So right. it's, a, it's gonna deal with this idea of, you know, toxicity with these relationships that exist within law enforcement. And does he become uh, a private eye in the sequel or, right? He does. So he kind of starts off, you know, at the end of Under Color of Law, I mean, he he can't really go back to being a cop at this time. <laughs> so it's, it's good. And you when know, you read so, the book, you'll find out why. Yeah. Yeah, he, he can't really go back. So, you know, he, he finds himself working kind of as a consultant and then in the second book, he he um, is a, a private investigator, uh, but not not in the sense that uh, what I think what people are used to, um, because he's investigating a particular type of individual. Well, you are being coy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Will you tag along with and or spend time with a private investigator to create that world with a little bit more realism? Well, the good thing is, at one point in my life, I was studying to be a private investigator because, um, yeah, so I, I had a lot of info. I had just like with, with, you know, LAPD, I still have a lot of training information. And, and, and so I got a whole closet full of stuff. And so, and you know, when I start pulling that stuff out, it's just scattered all over the floor. And I just kind of start organizing and thinking, okay, well, what can I pull in, um, to bring a level of, uh, you know, realism to it. Now in this book, you know, Trevor, like I said, he's, he's a private investigator, but it's just license only, you know, in terms of what he's doing, he still operates very much like a homicide detective. Um, and so he, you know, he carries himself the same way. Now he understands his position, you know, when he does encounter real, you know, people who are real, who are sworn and, you know, quote unquote, real cops and still cops, right. you know, so he, he understands, you know, how far he can go, but, um, you know, he's still very much Trevor Finnegan, um, still sharpening those detective skills, uh, and still getting, you know, kind of pushed through the ringer, 
uh, you know, so to speak. So. And I'm going to assume that Serata uh, stays in the picture. Yeah, yeah. So she's a big part of book two. Um, she is the catalyst in some ways. Um, you know, it's set in 2016, so it's, it's been a few years. So they, you know, they're together um, and really trying to work on having this uh, fruitful um, life. Uh, they're living in Sierra Madre, uh, you know, up uh, kind of right above Pasadena, you know, the nice little mountain town oh, yeah. uh, or foothill town, I should say. Yeah. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, they, they found a little bubble that they can exist in and they had, you know, he, he, he has his, his art, you know, studio and he's, he's enjoying himself, you know, money is not an issue. Um, and they kind of just looking forward to, um, taking this trip, uh, out of the country and, um, and that kind of symbolizes a lot, right? Because this is a, it's actually set, you know, a few a few days before the election. So <laughs> there's a lot for Sarah. Though, there's a lot riding on this trip because, you know, she's she's kind of like, eh, I don't know what's going on, you know. And I think it's good we might not be in the country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I love the way you dance around that. You're trying so hard not to tell me, but. I do want to, um, before we get to rapid fire questions, as we start to uh, wrap, I got a classic question that I offer all my guests and, and, and I got a good feeling that I'm going to get a great answer here. What is the best and uh, perhaps most concise piece of advice that you could offer my listeners? And, and, and my listener base is uh, established writers and up and coming writers, a lot of students, and uh, this is coming from mail that comes to me. And they're all looking for the secret sauce, the magic recipe, the, you know, the, the 10 points with which you've, you know, craft your career. And I'd love to hear what you have, Aaron. Okay, um, I might have two. Yeah, uh, you have is all you want, yeah. Um, which is interesting because I told this to my students. Uh, I teach uh, at, uh, at a UCLA extension. And so I, I, I always open my class with this, but I tell them, you know, oftentimes they say they don't know what they want to write, right? Oh, I don't know what I want to write. I, I'm, I'm still on the fence. I got this idea, that's that idea. And I say, okay, well go into a bookstore and see if you can find a book that mirrors your idea. See, look around, see if there's something on the shelf that's like that. And if you can't find it, then that's what you should write. You should write the book that's missing. You should write the book that you're so passionate about that, that you would wanna read, but doesn't exist yet. Um, and that's what I tell them. Cause I said, you gotta have passion to get through, you know, 300 pages. So, you know, if you're not excited about it, you're not enthusiastic about it, um, or you feel like there's something that, that it's already been done, so to speak, or something out there already exists that may have done what you're trying to do better find something else that you're really, really passionate about and you have that energy for. Um, so that's my first little piece of, of advice. Um, number two, and this is just my personal, uh, I guess, philosophy when it comes to writing, but also when it comes to editing, uh, is, you know, to paraphrase James Baldwin, you know, he said, write a sentence as clean as a ball. Um, you know, the idea that, and, I, and when I'm writing, I often have a poetry book next to me because it makes sure that my language that I'm using is getting to the heart of what I'm, I'm really trying to say. Um, you know, dialogue is, is obviously tricky, but when it comes to prose, it's just something where I, I just appreciate how poets can say so much using a few words and it could be poetic, it could be beautiful, and it could just have this, this stamp that just is so declarative where you're like, oh, Okay, and so that's what I strive for, at least with my, you know, my pros where, you know, I'm really trying to, um, you know, get to the beauty of something, uh, you know, and it's hard, for, you know, for, for poets, poets are masters at it, but for fiction authors, it's kind of like, you know, we often use more words than we need, you know, and so for me, I'm, that's what I focus on when I'm writing and when I'm editing is like, okay, what, what are we really trying to say here and how can we really craft this in a, a beautiful declarative way? Two really good uh, observations here. Number one, I love the way that you say, find the book that uh, you that hasn't been written yet and do it with a certain kind of passion because I, I agree with you. I, I often think this. If you're going to carve out, on average, 
let's just say on average, a year of your life to craft this book. You know, sometimes maybe it's three months, maybe it's six, but by the time you write it and then rewrite it and draft it and, you know, workshop it, etc., you're going to have a lot of time invested. So I think that's great advice. Was it Elmore Leonard that says, uh, take out all the stuff people hate, you know, <laughs> yeah. take out the stuff that bores people. Uh, and I'm, and I'm torn here. I think about Pat Conroy, for instance, and I reference him often who can take one sentence and paint this elaborate oil painting of a scene. Mm -hmm. And you go, how did you do that? It's just words. Then you can take Elmore Leonard over here, yeah. strip out any word that isn't even remotely necessary and accomplish an equally fabulous feat. I think that's one of the reasons I write to study the guys who really make me go, whoa. Yeah. And I think you make me go, whoa. So there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I look at it, every book is a, I tell my students, every book is an opportunity to learn something new. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's once you start writing, you're no longer, and it's kind of how I feel about film school. So before I went to film school, I watched films for pleasure, right? right. But once I went to film school, I'm like, oh, you know, you start noticing everything, everything becomes technical. So when I read, it's the same approach now where it's like, I'm reading and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this author executed this really well. Um, you know, the, it's showing me something. And so, you know, I tell my students, uh, all the time, because oftentimes when you get write, writing students, they have this notion that they're going to write, you know, the great American novel, and that's what they're in there for. Um, so they won't read anything else, right, besides what they call highbrow literature. Um, and so, you know, and I'm the crime guy. So I tell them, I say, you know what, you can learn a lot when it comes to suspense, when it comes to thrilling people from crime writers and thriller writers, you know, you have to get out of this kind of, well, I'm this type of writer, you know, you have to open it up because these books are all like little classes yeah. and it's an opportunity for you to be able to learn. Where do you teach? You said UCLA extension. Do you teach in Pasadena? At yeah. So they have, um, online, but they also have, on, well, they, they're back on campus now. So, um, you have the, the option, right? So I could go over to Westwood. It's just a bit of a drive. Um, so I haven't quite signed up for that, <laughs> but online, you know, online works for me. I think until maybe, if there happens to be a class, I, I, I feel like will work best with me there. Um, you know, I may consider it, but you know, right now online, it's, it's fine. Well, I'm going to say this. Um, if you were uh, teaching at the Westwood campus, I would make the drive to take that class. <laughs> I would. Thank you. <laughs> I think I could learn a lot from you and, uh, uh, P.S. That campus is pretty stunning. Oh yeah, <laughs> God. But just as a little, a little side note. Yeah. Uh, do you remember? Um, it was the mystery bookstore that used to be adjacent to uh, UCLA, um, and they closed. I want to say they closed. Was it 2012? Maybe. I remember that day because I was apparently the last one of the last readers to read the next day they shut the door. <laughs> oh, wow. Me. Yeah, it was like the next day. That was it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we ended up shut, shutting that place down. Man. Um, but yeah, that was a that was it was a great bookstore. I mean, it's it's a shame, but there is nothing like a great bookstore. Isn't it true? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, my rapid fire questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one. Okay. It's so easy. These uh, are actually kind of ordinary pen and paper or keyboard? Keyboard. Music in the background or silence? Silence. Plotter or pantser? Oh, plotter. Yeah. Question number two. And this one is likely because I'm a filmmaker and mm. uh, and I see most books as eventual TV series or film. I can't help it. Okay, Hollywood has just called Aaron and good news, good news, your book has just been greenlit for a major motion picture. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> who would you like to see play Trevor Finnegan? Actor who is on HBO's Insecure, uh, which actually ended uh, I think they do their last season. Kind of what I get with that is, and a lot of people do it differently, but you probably 
somewhere along the way, as you were crafting Finnegan Finn, you uh, perhaps pictured in his in your head who this was. Yeah, I tend to do a similar thing. You kind of oh, yeah. you know put some clothes on this character and hold them there so that you kind of hold them in their space while you're writing. All right, um, on a political front, if you're comfortable stating such. What is the one thing that is, if you could, you know, we'll use the phrase mage, uh, wave a magic wand, for lack of a better term, and change one thing in the, uh, this is a loaded question. If you could change one thing in the LAPD hierarchy, uh, or perhaps in the overall humanity of law enforcement, what would that one thing be? I know it's it's chock full of... That's a big one. Um, ooh. And you can be broad on this. You don't have to. I would say training. So I think a lot of the issues that happen uh, are issues that are cultivated within the academy. And I would completely start brand new in terms and get rid of a lot of the 1970s and 80s type of training <laughs> and start brand new um, and really craft a more intellectual atmosphere that encourages critical thinking and i'll leave that there <laughs> i gotta slow down and sip on that one for that's very thought provoking i'm gonna help you out here on a lighter note <laughs> you have been asked to speak at let's call it ucla you have all these eager young faces staring at you they're looking for that one little gem that will help them steer their course and yes, it's similar to what we mo uh, mentioned a second ago, but to make it different, let's say you're speaking to a crowd when you suddenly look out and see you. You're seeing your 18-year-old self staring back at you. Here's the question. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell young Aaron as it pertains to choosing a career and a purpose for your life to come? Mm. Oh, yeah, okay. this isn't any lightweight show, baby. <laughs> I'm getting in there. Wow. Um, trust your instincts. Excellent. Say, trust your instincts. Because for me, you know, while I did go from, from filmmaking and, and, and writing and visual, I used all those skills. They all, everything, every class I, I ever took in film school, every painting class I ever took, they all get used. So trust your instincts, you know, follow your gut. Um, but it's, it's to be a modern Renaissance individual these days is actually a good thing. Be hyphenated, <laughs> you know, author, screenwriter, filmmaker, you know, just be hyphenated because you're going to use all those skills uh, one way or the other. I love that. Be hyphenated. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to copyright that. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, I'm a I'm a hyphen. I'm an author and a podcast host and a filmmaker. So I, I I'm with you. You know, mm -hmm. if one thing is not necessarily working, or the trends of the time uh, fluctuate a bit, you can pick up some of your other uh, oh, yeah. more developed talents. Yeah. Or you, I mean, for me, I use a lot of my filmmaking uh, and editing skills uh, for book promotion. So, you know, I did my own book trailer, um, you know, oh. so all that stuff, you know, you know, I recorded parts of my own book, um, you know, things like that. That's Facebook ads. All that stuff is, is me, you know, as I move forward and, and we're, you know, I'm working right now to get the, um, with executives to, to package the, the pilot for under color of law, which is, we're working to get it, um, you know, in good shape, you know, I had to do the pitch deck. I, you know, my little graphic design skills came in handy, all those Adobe classes, and I was able to do the pitch deck and, you know, all that stuff. So you never lose those skills. They're there. Be hyphenated. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, my mantra would be first be caffeinated, then be hyphenated. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So is this, is it getting put into... A production in some form or fashion yeah i mean that's 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 the plan so the book won um the book pipeline uh adaptation award and so basically how that that works is run by pipeline artists who you know do a lot for screenwriters and, and and writers as well um but uh it won that award um 
And part of that deal is that, uh, you know, I start to, they work with me, you know, it's, it's undisclosed executives, but they work with you to get it together in terms of packaging um, and getting the, the pilot in great shape. And then, you know, they kind of tee up folks who are going to get it. So I kind of already know where it's headed um, and who will get their eyes on it. And so, you know, essentially it is just kind of like, wow. it's, make it as tight as possible and strong as possible. So, you know, people will, will go for it. I mean, obviously there's, there's the rights, right? There's film rights should always sell. But for me, you know, I kind of felt like, well, I spent all this money in film school. I got the receipts. I should at least be able to write, you know, the script. If something's wrong if I can't write. If they hate it, they hate it. But <laughs> if something's wrong if I can't sit down and, and write a pilot, you know. Right. And uh, is that a TV length or film length? It's television. Yeah. Okay, so, so right 40... now they're looking. Well, they look for like premiere, you know, premiere streamer sort of uh, gotcha. approach. Yeah. It's exciting time, isn't it? Uh, there's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk out of both sides of my mouth. So work with me here. It's an exciting time because there's so much need for collateral, right? Uh, we need more product, right? So there's, yes. and, and there's so many more streaming opportunities. Conversely, in this hand, wife and I have uh, been watching a vast sum of uh, volume of material, and you can tell the ones that. Uh, my opinion only, that were either rushed or not the best writers, or they're just cranking out a theme that has been beat to friggin' death. Yep. And you just go, man, how did that get made? Yeah, it's, and I agree with, I agree with that 100%. I think right now that there's this desire for IP, everybody wants content, you know, it's grab, 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 we don't care if it's a you know, IP is just being snatched up, uh, you know, left and right. And so there's a lot of stuff that you kind of have to sift through because it's a lot of stuff that just isn't high quality. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, it's 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 one of those things where I hope at least with with what I'm doing, you know, I, 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 I'm the type where if it doesn't feel right or it feels like the wrong direction, I'm I'm OK to say, you know what? We don't have to do it, you yeah. know, because yeah. I don't think every book needs to be made into into a movie or TV show. I don't think it has to. I think, you know, people need to be OK with just letting books exist as books, you know. Yeah, that sounds so good, Aaron. It sounds so noble. Uh, I, I have a hard time thinking that way, I suppose, because every time I write a story, I'm why. Who did I say this to? Uh or said this to me, it, some, it often feels like I'm transcribing a story as I, I'm like watching a movie and I'm transcribing it into my book. That's kind of how I, and that's because I suppose I'm so visually oriented. Oh yeah. 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 But yeah, to your point, you're right. Every book doesn't have to be made into it, but dead gum, I'm going to try my best to turn all mine that way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the thing. If you have, and that's what I tell people and I tell my students a lot is if they have that, that um, component there, right? Where you're seeing that story and it's, it is visual. Um, and you're saying like, oh, I can see this, how the scene would unfold. And you have that kind of ability to write that script. Then I always tell them, adapt your own, go for yeah. it. You know, but it, I think if you're an author and you don't have that and you're kind of like, hey, look, I'm fine in my lane. I, I like to write, you know, for those people I say, yeah, that's fine. If you, you know, go for it. Uh, you know, sell the rights off, do whatever you want to do. Um, but I also feel like there's times where I've gone and I've seen the movie, I've seen the adaptation, and I've thought, we didn't need that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> they can't all be drive. They can't all be, you know, they can't all be wonderful um, adaptations. Uh, and so rather than force something, I, I say, you know, it's okay that it's a, a book and we, we, as consumers should just let that be what it is. Yeah. Quick question. This triggered something you just said. I still have one more uh, rapid fire question for you. What do you think about screenplay writing? What do you, what do you, what kind of advice would you give to my writer friends listening who fancy themselves or would like to consider getting into the screenwriting business, which is a tough one? Oh yeah. Uh, it's not like writing a book. And you have to go into it knowing that what you're writing is a blueprint. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, you know, 
part of the reason I, I switched to fiction is because I wanted to have little autonomy, right? I wanted to be able to have a say in how the story went. If I write a screenplay, it doesn't exist on its own. It's the ideas for it to be made. And that is nothing more than a blueprint for the filmmaker. So, you know, if you're okay with that, then you're going to you're going to be fine when it comes to transitioning and becoming, you know, writing a screenplay or becoming a screenwriter. If you have trouble with that um, and you feel like you have to have the final say, uh, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, just just don't do it. But you don't see screenplay writing as its own craft as insurmountable, do you? It's part of the jaded part of me. I think I spent too much time <laughs> in film school. <laughs> I, I, it messed me up. I just don't, you know, okay. I, I don't see it. I think it's it's a wonderful art form. Don't get yeah. me wrong. I, I really think like I've read screenplays where, I, where they blow me away and I've been like, well, that was a wonderful story. And inside my head, the movie that's in my head, it's a blockbuster. It's an Oscar winner. Sure. But then, you know, someone's got to take that and they're going to have to make that into, you know, a film. And it might not translate the way that you saw it. And because of that, because of that little step, that little big step, <laughs> that's why I just can't, you know, I, 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 I don't caution my students, but I tell them it's a different hat you're wearing. Yeah. So just understand that going in, it's a different hat, unless you are going to be the creator and the director and you're going to take this thing over or you're independently funding it. Like, you know, but if you're going to go kind of the traditional route and you're going to pitch this thing, um, you know, just be ready to hear some very wackadoo stuff that <laughs> people are not going to get it, you know, or people are going to say, what if, you know, because the worst question is always sort of, sorry, with, you know, in Hollywood, what if we did? And it's always yeah. like, <laughs> you know, you already know where it's headed. <laughs> what if instead of a man, it's a woman? Yeah. And instead, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, that, and, and sometimes changes work, right? So you look at yeah. Lawrence Block. The other night I was watching uh, Eight Million Ways to Die, right? Yeah. And, you know, it worked with him being a L.A. County Sheriff. It, 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 it was something, it's a different story yeah. a little bit. You know, the bones are there, but somehow, some way, setting it in L.A. just was like, maybe it felt a little more hard boiled or a little more, you know, it's, it's drenched. Each shot is drenched in sunlight, but it's so dark, you know, and it's just like this, you know, he's terrible. I mean, Scudder is, is he's got problems, you know, yeah. but it's just like, he's, it's set in this really like, you know, it's the eighties. So it's like this smog layer of smog on everything, you know, and it just felt different than when I read the book and I was like, okay, well, this is New York, you know, yeah. the East Coast. But something about the film was different. And in that way, it worked. But the spirit of the of the book was still there. But it's a little bit of a different, you know, in terms of mise en scene, it's, it's different, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, the, my, my fifth and final is way out of left field. Okay. <laughs> but I know you can handle it on a somewhat similar note to number one. Broadway has now called and wants to turn Under Color of Law into a big Broadway musical. Okay, wait. And you get to choose some of the theme of what the show will become. So the question is, what artist or sort of music would you choose to play the backdrop, or better yet, the environment of this Broadway show, Under Color of Law? Okay. Yeah. See, you can't get this just everywhere. <laughs> this is, yeah. Okay. Let me think about this one. Yeah. All right. So I would say uh -huh. Terrence Blanchard in terms of kind of a score. Okay. I would have to have Terrence Blanchard, All right. you know, very orchestral. Um, but then in terms of, I think in terms of maybe just building the soundtrack out. So when I was writing Under Color of Law, and even when I'm writing this one, I was listening to a lot of 90s grunge. Um, oh. And so Trevor Finnegan is his lover of, of the 90s. Um, and so I would have, you know, a lot of, throw some, some renditions of, maybe even Terrence could do it, but renditions of like Nirvana, Pearl Jam in there. Um, you know, just kind of these darker versions of these alternative kind of maybe grungy, you know, 90s rock songs. Um, and, and I think that would be interesting. I think that'd be kind of fun. Well, and here's part of the reason I asked this, Aaron, because <clears throat> who would have ever thought a couple of years back, a handful of years back, that anybody would create a Broadway musical out of a, 
a character out of political history, say like Hamilton. Yeah. And it become such a phenomenon. Yeah. So uh, my mind always, th you know, I'm always thinking, well, why not? It's yeah. I kind of live my life and why not try and see it? But yeah, so a grunge, 90s grunge, Terrence Blanchard inspired Broadway musical called Under Color of Law. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the, I guess that's the pitch right there. <laughs> that is the pitch. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll take my 10% and... <laughs> If you'd like to learn more about Aaron, visit him at AaronPhilipClark.com. You can follow Aaron on Twitter. You got to write this one down. It's underscore write me a world. That is the most creative one I've seen yet, Aaron. I'll tell you that oh, one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been a hoot. Oh, this has been great. This is a lot of fun, David. Thank yeah, you. I'm thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to come. And I'm telling you, dude, you're you're just you're going to be one of those guys i have a f feeling you know five and ten if not sooner years from now we're going to be going that guy that guy <laughs> that guy <laughs> well hey i would love to be that guy that sounds good to me i think you already are that guy okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> either way you're back on the show to be talking about the next one so you can just count on ooh, that ooh. yeah all right. Thank you for your time. I know that I've gone a half hour over, but you know, shit happens. It's good, man. This has been great. A lot Absolutely. of fun. Yes. I appreciate sir. it. Thank you. Yeah. That was a good book under color of law, Aaron Clark, man. Appreciate your time. A lot of fun. All right. Before I get to next week's guest, let me say thank you. Thank you so much for your support of the Thriller Zone. We are rapidly approaching our first 100 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash David Temple Author. So thank you so much. Also, thank you for the letters that have been coming in saying how much you like the show and who you'd like to see on the show. And if you haven't done so yet, write us at thethrillerzone at gmail.com. You can also swing by any one of your podcast channels, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, you name it. Leave us a review. Five stars. We really like. Now, next week's show, it's kind of a generic. It's an arc. You know, they hadn't had uh, the, everything completely finished. But my guest is Ward Larson, and the book is Assassin's Edge. If you're a Ward Larson fan, I think you're in for a real treat. I will admit it's my first time reading him and I'm very excited and I'm um, well into the book and it is a riveting read. So join me next week as we kick off April. Sh I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sing, but uh, join us as we kick off April. And boy, do we have a stack of massive talent here at your front row seat to the best thriller authors in the world. Where else? The Thriller Zone. Until next time, I'm David Temple. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time on The Thriller Zone.